Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm going to be doing another episode of The New Yorker. So we're going to go over the news dealing with the strikes that just happened on Friday and over the over the weekend. Uh, and I will put my two cents in. We're going to drop into Al Jazeera, and then we're going to also look at some other news that has been covering this, and I'll give you my perspective. I want to remind the audience, though, this idea of the Tetragrammaton, which is the name, God's name in Hebrew letters, all right? There, it's, it's called the Tetragrammaton, and the, the, those letters can be rearranged in certain ways. And depending on which way the arrangement is, depends on what month it is and what hour it is. Uh, for the first half of, of, you know, the first 12 hours of the, of the day, starting at midnight. Um, and then an Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, um, is added in with that permutation to be the other 12 hours of the day. But that, the, in the purest sense, for the, te the tetragrammaton without the Aleph, uh, there, there is combinations that relate to each of the months. And that I have said in my previous video about how the, the, there are six months that are very strong for Jacob and there are six months that are very strong for Esau. And we just went into the period of time where the strength for Jacob is gonna get stronger and, the, and Esau is gonna get weaker. So, you know, roughly February, March, April, April will be the peak strength for Jacob. And then it will start to wane, but still be relatively stronger than Esau going all the way into um, May, June, and July. All right. And then in August will be the switch where Esau gets stronger. All right. And will peak through August, September, October will be its peak point. So April roughly is the peak for Jacob. October is for Esau. Now, a lot of bad things happen in October, all right? And, uh, you know, keep that in mind. If you look at your life and you look at world events, a lot has happened within that August to October time frame. Um, and then Esau will start to wane in strength, but still be relatively stronger than Jacob all the way through January. So keep that in mind while this is happening, all right? And why it is important to strike the iron when it's hot, all right? And I'm sure you haven't heard that from anybody else other than me. So let's go into Al Jazeera. Lawrence Cole, do you want to come back on, on anything that you've heard so far before I put a direct question to you? Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind and that we left Iraq in 2011. In fact, I talked to Maliki about uh, Spain. Basically, we came back in 2014 at their invitation because of what ISIS was doing. And basically, that has been our role. Mm. Uh, before October 7th, we were carrying this out. We were talking to the Iraqis about leaving. Sometimes they say something publicly, but privately, no, they still wanted us to say. Uh, but after uh, October 7th, you had over 160 attacks on the American forces there in Iraq and in Syria. Fortunately, no one was killed, so our response was not overwhelming or as uh, strong as it has been when the Americans died. And that's where we are right, right now. And my experience with the Iraqis, a lot of times they'll say something publicly to appease the Iranians, but then privately they'll say, no, no, we really still want you to stay. What does it mean for the U.S.'s desire to withdraw uh, from Iraq completely? Will it, as Iran's foreign ministry said, lead to the U.S.? actually becoming more or less involved in the region? Well, again, a lot depends upon how long we need to 
uh, go after the groups that were responsible, not only for killing the Americans, but there's 160 attacks. And whether Iran will try and rein these groups in. And, you know, Iran has three proxies in the region. They've got the Houthis in Yemen, they've got, uh, they've got Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, and then they've got the, uh, these uh, Iraqi uh, groups uh, in, uh, in, in Iraq. They completely control Hezbollah. The others, they don't have much control, but they have some. And I think this is what we're going to expect, not only in Iraq, but with the uh, Houthis. Mohammed Morandi, U.S. National Security Spokesman John Kirby, said that the, the goal is to get the attacks on U.S. interests to stop. We're not, he said, quote, looking for a war with Iran. Now, no targets were hit within Iran in these retaliatory strikes. How will Iran and its proxies respond? Will it, will it uh, rein these groups in, as uh, Lawrence said the U.S. wants it to? Well, let's be clear. Contrary to what your guest in the United States says, these are not proxies. And the real issue here is the genocide in Gaza. I have no doubt about it. And the United States, as we speak, is preparing the Israeli regime for an, an expansion in Lebanon. So in the coming week. Under the, the banner here, it's saying U.S. says it hit 84 targets in Syria and Iraq. I don't know the composition and how that 84 is divided up um, in response to the attack that killed U.S. troops. So. Hopefully, we'll get more details. May have heavy fighting uh, in southern Lebanon. Uh, the United States is not retaliating in Syria. The United States is an illegal occupation force in Syria. In the Al Tanf area, where it occupies, in fact, there are tribes that were loyal to ISIS. Those tribes are trained by the Americans right now, and they use that area, Al Tanf to attack Syrian government forces. And in the, in the last couple of months, they carried out two major attacks, in each case killing between 15 to 20 uh, conscript soldiers on buses, and I think on both occasions. So the United States, its presence in Syria is illegal. It is stealing Syrian oil in the east of the country and exporting it. In Iraq, the United States has bombed Iraqi military positions. It has destroyed Iraqi facilities that were constructed and paid for by the Iraqi government. This is the reality on the ground. Nothing will change that. And I should also add that the United I States- I suspect because of this transition that took place in February, actually it was late January, it's based on a lunar calendar, but but um, that um, on uh, Tubishvat, that transition into the strengthening of Jacob and the weakening of Esau, you're going to see on the news that that most likely the Syrians, the Lebanese, Hezbollah, Iran, the Houthis, Hamas, they're going to start losing ground. They may be losing ground militarily, actually on the battlefield, and or also in the media. Something's going to happen where there's going to be a turn that will demonize or ostracize Esau. After the assassination of the Iraqi commander Abu Mahdi al Mohandis, alongside General Qasem Soleimani, at the Iraqi International Airport four, over four years ago, the Iraqi parliament demanded that the United States leave, and they never did. They said they'd leave, but the United States has one strong card to play with, and that is that all of Iraqi oil that is sold, the money goes to accounts in the United States. And whenever the Iraqi government goes too far, the Americans start withholding Iraqi funds and creating a crisis in Iraq. So the Americans are like the godfather. They stand back, they pretend they're the good guys, but just like in Gaza where they are part of the, this genocide, 
uh, and here they played the same role. Remember, the United States and Iraq, they helped Saddam Hussein. The West gave Saddam Hussein chemical weapons. The U.S. fought alongside Saddam Hussein against Iran in 1988, striking Iranian ships. And then it turned against Iraq. Later on, it invaded Iraq. Who created this mess? It was the United States. Lawrence, do you want to come back on, on that? Well, I think that you should bring well, it all the way back to the 1950s, right? And, you know, and he's right that, you know, that we've been on both sides of this, on the Iranian side and on the Iraqi side. Um, and, you know, in contemporary history, you know, going, you know, about 1970s all the way to now, it's been anti-Iranian. Um, but uh, we, we have a problem with the national security state. I've been saying this from day one, right? The national security state needs to be taken down. It should be dismantled. Less power should be given to the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, all this stuff. Their data collection and their servers should be destroyed. All these things should be happening from an edict from Congress. Unfortunately, we have stupid citizens that don't demand this. Instead, we have citizens that worry about football games. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with worrying about a football game. It's just that realize that what the Federal Reserve does and what the national security state does is way more important than a football game. Fed policy and what is going on with the national security state is way more important. And so, therefore, you should focus on where the ball is. And that ball is National Security State, the Federal Reserve. Now, to solve this problem in the, in the near term, it's to, to realize that the national security state going all the way for Iran, going all the way back to the 1950s under Eisenhower um, has caused a problem, all right? Well, we are also in a transitional point where the balance of power, the borders of the Middle East are gonna be changing in our lifetime. So, you know, and we've been kicking the can down the road for so long because, you know, we're trying to hide some of the things that we were doing many decades ago or, you know, realigning in a certain way because of a change in oil supply or whatever it is. The reality is, is that we should just get the job done, clean up the mess, you know, but to be isolationist is only going to make it worse because, you know, this guy hasn't said anything about how the Ayatollah wants to wipe out the great Satan and the little Satan, which is the United States and Israel. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's from Tehran. Yeah, and I think it's important to keep in mind that we did leave when the Iraqis asked us to leave, okay? We were willing to leave some troops there, but Maliki said no, so we left completely. We were asked to come back by the Iraqi government. And the other thing I think is important to keep in mind, the Iraqi government publicly will say things to appease Iran, but privately they'll tell us, no, we really still want you to, uh, uh, to stay. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And basically, we ended up in Syria to fight ISIS, which was going after the Iraqi Kurds. That's why we were, were up there. So this has been our role. And prior to the, attack, the uh, October 7th attacks, there was no conflict going on. There was no shelling or anything like that. It was October 7th when Iran, I think, gave the green light to a lot of what they call the Quds Force uh, people in Iraq to attack Americans in Iraq and, and uh, Syria. So I think but, but, that, that but, is the key. But, but Morris, I mean, how, how do you answer uh, uh, Professor Miranda's accusations that, 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 that the U.S. has ultimately caused all, all of this? Um, you know, he, for instance, he was, he was saying that, that the U.S. is in Syria illegally and is stealing its oil. You know, wait a second. We're not there illegally. 
We went there when the Iraqi government asked us to protect the Iraqi Kurds and ISIS went up into Syria. That's where we're there. We're not there. In fact, we've been criticized for not getting involved in the Syrian civil war, which was part of the Arab Spring. Right, I know you're waiting patiently, but I'll just throw, throw it briefly back to, to Mohammed Miranda just, just to answer that, and then we'll move on. Look, I gave the evidence. People can go back to the email, Jake Sullivan. They can go to the Defense Intelligence Agency documents of 2012. They can go to Michael Flynn's interview on Al Jazeera. They can also go and look at the history of the U.S. stealing oil. They can also go back into 2014 and 2015 when Iraqi oil was being sold at, by ISIS to neighboring countries and to Arabia as well. And the U.S. Air Force back then was flying over ISIS positions and they never struck any of those thousands of tankers. It was only when the Russians actually entered, one of the first things that they did was they, they struck those convoys. The history of the United States and ISIS is clear as day. And the United States, its history with Saddam Hussein, being an ally of Saddam Hussein, and with the West giving him chemical weapons, that is clear as day as well. Right. But the United States always wants to present itself as the protagonist, just like in Gaza. Okay. In Gaza, it's the Palestinians' fault. History began on October the 7th. End of story. That's not going to solve the problem for the United States. The United States is a declining power, and it has to begin to look at reality okay. objectively. Otherwise, right. it will suffer more than anyone else. All right, Rena, th thanks for, for waiting so patiently. Before, again, I ask you a, a, a specific question. Do you, do you just want to uh, uh, want to come in on, on, on what you've heard here? Yeah, sure. I think the, you know trying to build a narrative between good guys and bad guys, no matter who is on the good and bad, isn't really helpful to trying to understand what is going on. Of course, both the Iranians and the Americans pursue their interests. They pursue politically, economically, militarily, how they could maintain as much influence as possible in the in, in the in the region. Now, what's become clear is that the Americans have had more of an incoherence to their foreign policy, withdrawing at times, coming back in, really being unable to maintain strong influence. And, and then if you look at the other side, the Iranians have. The Iranians have built strong networks of I think power part of that instabi I think that part of that instability that this person is mentioning about foreign policy from the perspective of the United States is because of um, we are a weakening power for many different reasons. But let's focus on the debt. The United States is too far in debt and that we've had over a 20 year war in the Middle East right after 9-11, all right? Now we've retreated and we, you know, resupplied some bases and stuff like that. But in essence, you know, we have ended a, a war Po, you know, post 9-11, and where it looks like something new is starting to emerge. Um, but again, you know, we're humans and we have to try to delineate different eras, all right, different epochs, all right? So, um, so that's a human construct. But the weakening of the United States is because of its over-indebtedness. Its population is not very bright, all right? Some of them are hardworking, many are not. Um, and it's not about just formal education, it's about just skills in general. The skill base in the United States is going down. Um, and unfortunately, we are riding a, um, a, a productive, from the productive eras of before. And we're still coasting from that, still coasting from the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s, the 70s, the 80s. Yes, new things are coming online. New things are, new products are being developed, but the, the innovation is declined. We have outsourced a lot of it. Part of that is because of corporate America trying to cheapen stuff. Services, if you notice, are going down in quality. Um, the quality of products have gone down. 
Now you have niche markets where service is really good and products are really good, but just in general, there is a decline that's going on in the United States. And there is a decline in the number of optionality for a particular product when you go to a store. You know, pre, pre-crisis of 2020, you may have had 18 different versions of, of a product. Now you may only have six that's on the, on, the, on the store shelves. So there is a reduction of things that are taking place in our society. But there's also an educational reduction that's taking place. People, even if they do get formally educated, aren't, aren't as, as, quote, educated as they should be. The skills of people are going down. You know, part of that is uh, too much screen time. Part of that is lack of um, etiquette, lack of morals. There is a decline in the society. There is a hedonistic decline of, of America, of the United States. And we have this over-indebtedness. And because of this over-indebtedness, we can't project internationally like we used to for you know over many years. And so there is a some sort of a, a pushback from the population and from Congress saying, we can't afford this. And then you have a lot of social programs because things are becoming domestically problematic in terms of people having good jobs and, you know, and, you know, cities, you know, having services that it should be providing. These inner cities are having problems and there's a lot of crime and there's a lot of corruption. So there's more money being dumped into the domestic front and not so much on the international front which um, causes a problem for us to project our hegemonic power. And this rising of Asia, especially China, flexing its muscles in the region and wanting Taiwan, causes hegemonic power in the Pacific for the United States to either reassert its, its prowess or retreat. We can't be in both areas, both regions, conventionally. We could do it unconventionally, meaning nuclear war, but we can't be in the Middle East and in Asia at the same time conventionally. We don't have the forces, we don't have the money. And the United States is more like the UK pre-World War One, And uh, I think what will happen is is that the United States will win a war between China, but we will will no longer be a rising superpower. We will no longer be the superpower. We will be diminished and, and the world will be fractured. And eventually because of that weakening, internal instability may lead to a fracturing of of the states. Um, That's farther down the road. But I think in the big arc of this, the United States metaphysically is the yoke for Israel. And that as Israel in the Middle East starts to flourish after this big crisis, this big conflict, this big war that will happen, then um, you know that yoke from the United States will be the energy source for the Middle East to become a new metropolis, a new region of commerce, of science and technology. It's not going to be Asia, and it's not going to be the United States. And I'm, you know, I'm seeing this many, many, many years down the road here. And that's this fetus of, of Israel be, feeding off the yoke of, of the United States. This fetus in that whole Middle Eastern region is going to start to blossom, but only after the tumultuous times that we are just starting to see here. There were some episodic um, tumultuous things that were happening um, with 
you know, with the Middle East during the Iraq War, during the Afghan War, you know, the Syrian War. These are minor compared to what, what I'm talking about with the changing of the borders for Israel. We're talking World War Three type stuff, right? So the United States, yeah, is, it is strong, but we're weak at the same time. The majority of the people that are in the military are not fit. If you don't believe me, just ask people that are in the military. The majority are not fit, either emotionally or physically, probably both, right? And then the problem is, is look at the population. The people that the military needs to pull from if we need to fill those those positions in, in a war, war situation. Do we really have mentally or physically capable individuals? Now, hence, you know, Boston Robotics is developing technologies where maybe we need less human forces. But let's just face it. The majority of the people are too fat, too stupid, too lazy in America. How are we going to win a war with that? We can't. We can't. The whole idea of football back in, you know, in the day of the early, you know, the early days of football in late 1800s and early 1900s was to have physical, ex physical activities to have the, uh, a population ready if they need to go to war. It was to kind of harness that animal spirit. Where is that today? Where someone is just eating a bunch of Doritos and watching something on TV, just getting fat on the on on on, on the couch. That's that's America right there, in a nutshell. You know, a lot of people don't want to admit to it, but sadly, that is America. across the region with a plan in sight, not a plan for just today and tomorrow, but a plan for, you know, decades in advance. And that's the strategic difference. The, the Biden administration right now, you know, before October 7th, was withdrawing from Iraq. There was the joint cooperation, the, you know, dialogue, security dialogue, in which the, the Biden administration was basically saying, we are withdrawing our, our troops, and this is what we want. And, and, and the Iraqi government was, was on the same page. So there was a process, a roadmap. Now, of course, October 7th has had, you know, it's complicated that because of Israel's bombardment of, of Gaza and, and, and also attacks against, you know, it, against Americans in, in, in Iraq and Syria, as we've seen, including the deaths, it's hard for the Biden administration now to be seen as withdrawing, especially in light of what happened in Afghanistan. The Biden administration doesn't want to leave looking like it's running away or that it looks appears weak. So that's where we're stuck right now. It's very okay. clear that both the Americans and the Iraq government want to, with, want to withdraw, but how you how you construct that theater is, is, is the challenge. And, and, and as far as the strikes themselves are, are concerned, what, what are we to make of the, the scale and scope of them, were you surprised at, at how far they went, and, and will they, uh, as National Security Spokesman John Kirby uh, is hoping, uh, uh, get the attacks against U.S. interests in the region to stop? Well, first of all, I mean, there have been attacks against Qatar, Hezbollah, and, and other of these armed groups, these Iran allied groups in Iraq and Syria for many years. Um, you know, places like Al Qaim, which was hit quite heavily, have has constantly been, been hit over the years. So I wasn't surprised as such by, by, by these hits. You know, Abu Mahdi al Mohendis, who was killed uh, alongside Qasem Soleimani by the Americans, you know, in January 2020, was the head of Qatar, Hezbollah, and, and many of these groups. I think what's become clear is as a response, you could attack, you could kill their leaders, you could continue to, to attack their economic interests, you can sanction them, but this isn't working. These groups are surviving and, and, and they're more influential. So there's just a fundamental predicament that the Americans have, and that is that their policy tools, whether it's attacking, whether it's sanctioning, isn't working to advance American interests. Laura Scott, to what extent did President Biden have to act and, and order these strikes. He, he was in a pretty impossible position, wasn't he, but needed to tread a fine line between deterrence, as, as the US sees it, and escalation. 
Well, no doubt about it. He had to do something, both, I think, strategically and politically, because he's up for re-election, and the Republicans have criticized him for just leaving our troops in there, in their view, defenseless. So I think his first response was very, very well planned. Okay, unfortunately, some people were killed, about 37 in the two places, but they attacked the infrastructure of the forces there, about 85 of the targets so far. And this will make it more difficult for them to continue. This guy sounds apologetic that the enemy that the United States attacked killed people. The strike package that they used was well-planned, but not far enough. And don't be apologetic when you kill the enemy. See, this is the problem that we have, that we're just kicking the can down the road. And it costs more, and more people will die when we don't do a full-out retaliatory strike, not this chicken shit that we've been doing. And this is the problem. We got a society, a bunch of full of snowflakes. Attacking the American, uh, the American uh, uh, forces. So I think it's been measured. What I think was really significant is the fact that we used B-1 bombers that flew all the way from the United States because these are nuclear capable. Now, they weren't taking nuclear bombs, but they can really uh, unleash devastating consequences much more than a, a fighter aircraft that you might have on an aircraft carrier. And the other thing is I think we're basically working <clears throat> with the Iranians to ensure this doesn't get out of hand. Remember, we alerted the Iranians that ISIS were going to attack them about a month ago. We told them, because that's why we're there. Remember, ISIS is the one who attacked us on 9-11. So we have been concerned about it. We okay. were not involved in the... No, 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 no. I, just, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was, I was just coming towards the end of, end of your point here. But, 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 Mark but, my words, even though we're going to see the fall of the United States sometime in our lifetime. <laughs> All right, uh, you know, at least our hegemonic power is going to be declining rapidly. Um, the something similar to 9 11 is going to happen in biologics from the Middle East if we don't get this shit done. We're moving into a different era because of the crisis that we went through. And the Iranians aren't dumb people. The Americans are. The Americans are a bunch of stupid fucks. And the United States, if they don't go all out and stop being apologetic, we're going to have something much worse than we've ever seen before. My Andy is, uh, I can see him smiling and shaking his head here. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and he wants to, wants to get it. Go, go ahead, Mullen. <laughs> yes, the Americans did not give any intelligence about the bomb attack. Uh, that is just a, a fable. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, the facts remain the facts. The United States occupation in Syria and Iraq are illegal. Contrary to what your good guests in London believes the United States have, has no plans to leave Syria or Iraq. And the United States has been dragging its feet as much as possible, and it will do so unless forced to leave. But what the United States did last night is not going to change anything. They, most of the people that they killed were innocent people. They bombed a bakery, they bombed a gas, gas station, they bombed a recreational park, and they killed a few Syrians and a few Iraqis. They didn't touch Iranians. And they bombed the same place that they've been bombing for many years. They bombed, as your guests in London pointed out, they bombed these areas in the past. And it is interesting that as soon as the Americans carried out these airstrikes, ISIS... The American strike is too little, too late. And we are run by a bunch of idiots. And the Pentagon is full of participation general, participation medalists that didn't win a war.
tapped these bases in four different areas. Why is that the case? Because the United States has been working with the tribes that were with ISIS before, and Al Tanf is a center for that. So ultimately, if the United States wants to continue down this road, it can. Right. It can kill more people, it yeah. can create more misery. But okay. this is going to get worse, and the United States ultimately, just as it failed in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Yemen and elsewhere, is going to fail here as well. Okay, we're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Renato, I will come back to you. You can have the final word. But first, I, I, I've got to let, let Lawrence respond to, to what he's just said. Well, again, I think it's important to keep in mind, we wanted to get out of Iraq. It was a mistake for us to invade, and it cost us much more than we thought. We were asked to go back. I can't emphasize that too much because... President Obama was trying to get out of uh, that, that area. He campaigned on it. We were asked to go back. That's why we went back. And we have backed. Obama, I swear, was a Manchurian candidate. All right, let's go to General Jack King. I notice a difference when I take Alpha Brain. I am on a another plane. I'm at working at higher RPMs. Well, U.S. officials have confirmed to Fox that the drone that killed three U.S. soldiers and injured more than 40 others was manufactured by Iran. Defense Secretary Austin revealed today that there is a multi-tiered response that is planned for this. With me now is retired Army General Jack Keane. Uh, General, thank you so much for being here. Now, I, I suppose it's no surprise that these things were manufactured uh, in Iran, but the real question is whether Iran gave the, the Houthis or whoever's responsible for this the, the, the information, the control, the, it was a, whether it was a command and control situation that originated in Iran. What do you think? Go back to about... I want to say 2020, uh, go back to, in the news, go back to about 2014 or yeah, or maybe 2013. There was a drone that we were fl flying around that the Iranians shot down. It was North and Grumman drone system. And they knocked it down, not by hitting the drone, but knocking out the communication towers or jamming the communication towers and it lost it lost its its feed and did a soft landing and the iranians took it all right i believe it was a soft landing. i don't think it was a crash landing. it might have been a crash landing, but I, I think it was a soft one and you know how i know this is because one of the PhD students that I, that I knew at Walden University did the code for that drone system, all right, at North and Grumman, all right? That's how I know this, all right? We provided, because we were doing, quote, surveillance on Iran, another CIA bullshit national security state thing that was going on, where something went wrong and technology was transferred over to Iran. I'm sure Fox News won't fucking say that. Well, here's what the Iranians do. I mean, they arm them, they train them in their training centers, and they sometimes bring training teams to their location, like they've done with uh, Hezbollah many times, and they also fund them. They provide them intelligence. There's, there's no secret where our bases are. So I think the Iranian-backed militias kind of know that. Uh, when it comes to the Houthis, however, the Iranians are providing them uh, daily intelligence on where the shipping are and, and what their locations are and what the flags uh, those ships are representing. So they're involved in the intelligence business as well. And the IRGC leaders have regular contact uh, with these uh, with these proxies, the Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria, and, and also the Houthis. They're all tied together in a network. Yeah. Uh, you know whether they tell them to hit this particular target, I think, is quite irrelevant. Well, the, the issue is 
these these proxies are carrying out the objectives of what Iran has right. to include the objectives that the militias have themselves. But wasn't there an actual spy ship, an Iranian spy ship uh, in the Red Sea that was directing some of their, their pirating that was going on? Yeah, absolutely. And certainly we're tracking that ship, and I hope it's on a target list. Yeah, well, I was going to say, why are we tracking it? Why are we, why are we hitting it? I agree with you. It already should have been uh, hit and, and put out a commission or just some period. Yeah, well, that's what Ronald Reagan did it to half the, the Iranian Navy when, when he hit back. Here's what Victor Davis Hanson says about what's happening right now. I mean, we don't know what, what is being planned, and we shouldn't know what's being planned. Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon yet that we need to worry about. But yet we are so concerned about the Iranians and how they're gonna act. Can you imagine when they do get nuclear weapons? Our country is being sold down the river. The ones that are in power are taking advantage of the stupid population in the United States. So they benefit and they don't care if they sell the country and destroy it because they're benefiting. An isolationist policy is a policy of accelerating the destruction of the United States. I know it sounds paradoxical, but some wars have to be fought. It has been five days. Victor Davis wrote, when serially attacked, loudly responding that we will only proportionally strike back and wish no wider war will only ensure a big, ugly one. Do you agree or disagree with that? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, we've lost our ability to deter what happened with Russia. Uh, we see it here uh, with Iran. And we see it also with uh, President Xi's aggressiveness for the last two to three years, which has increased and escalated. And we haven't been able to deter that in terms of his military intimidation of us more than we've ever seen. Yeah. And also Taiwan. I, I think what's really needed here is the Biden administration has got to reset its strategy with Iran. Now, Iran is the key player here. Internationally, in terms of diplomacy, stop the negotiations, shut all of that down, shut the appeasement down. And what we need to do is isolate Iran internationally with our allies and partners. That'll take a little work because there's a number of European nations want to do business with them. But let's get on with it. Number two, economically, let's go back to the maximum sanctions. Absolutely. Shut down any loopholes to include loopholes with China. Now this, this will take some time. To let's have forget some about sanctions. Well, let's take off all the sanctions. Fly those B-1 bombers and burn the turbine off of the Ayatollah. That's how you're going to get it done. Where even Mr. General is didn't want to war. Why? Because we pulled back from the sanctions. And then in terms of military issues with the Iranians, I don't think you go after commercial targets that have civilian population that could be involved. The, the, the civilian people already fundamentally opposed to this regime. Let's go after the IRGC who supervises them, funds them, trains them. Coastal bases, for sure, IS, IRGC leaders, wherever they are, and, and as long as there's no collateral damage with civilians there. And that will make Iran pay a price. Now, they don't have a lot of capability. When Reagan took out half of their Navy, it was about a half a dozen ships. Uh, and most of those were, were fairly small. But nonetheless, it's what they have, and it will have meaning to them. And also, it will frustrate the daylights out of them because that's real capability and it also will show a vulnerability that they have to their proxies. And right now their proxies look at Iran and they see them as being invulnerable. The United States avoids them and it gives them more power and more legitimacy yeah. with those proxies. Well we should we should start with that spy ship. That's that's an easy target for us, I would I would hope to say. I mean it's I why that still is is floating is beyond me. General, before we go. Happy birthday to you, sir. Great to have you on. Wonderful to know you. Thank you for being here. If you're a business owner, then animated explainer videos are the best way to capture attention.
get more followers, and drive more sales. Right into the news. Let's pull up this latest tweet from U.S. Central Command. The U.S. and Britain striking at least 36 Houthi targets in Yemen today, according to the AP, and a second wave of assaults meant to further disable Iran-backed groups that have relentlessly attacked American and international interests in the wake of the israel Hamas war. How it feels like uh, we've talked about retaliatory attacks like this in Yemen. Um, you know, is there any way to measure at this point how much of a debt the coalition has put into the Houthi forces since this all began? Austin, that's a great question. You know, one of the things they're doing is battle damage assessment, trying to figure out have we degraded their capabilities. I think what you're looking at with these strikes is really coming from the, the BDA, the battle damage assessment for the previous strikes and trying to figure out, okay, where have they been launching from? Where have they been storing those missiles, those drones? Uh, how do they know to hit those ships, the, uh, the radar that they would use to find them? Basically going back and trying to figure out where is their stuff coming from and then how can we take that out? And that's what it sounds like was done here in Yemen. Uh, my understanding is the authorization for this particular strike, the one that's just taken place, uh, was actually a few days ago. Now, that doesn't mean they have every target figured out exactly, but, but it's a pretty wide array of targets, 36 targets uh, over 13 different locations. Uh, they took out uh, a, a what is reported to be a buried uh, uh, ammunition or weapons storage facility, which presumes that there's some sort of concrete, and that would require a certain type of munitions. It can go in and actually you know, drill into there before it explodes and then uh, causing the damage that would be necessary. So that that was probably something that took a while to A, locate, and then B, put everything in place that they could actually target it. Then the other thing is they took out a radar, which is kind of very consistent with, you know, they're trying to uh, eliminate as many of these radars as possible, the ones that look out that they can use to uh, see ships out of sea. It's a big challenge in Yemen. Yemen, unlike other parts of the Middle East, has some very steep terrain. So they can actually sit up on top of uh, a, a mountainside, if you will, and look out on the ocean. There's other places in the Middle East you really can't do that because it basically just goes into a, a, a low plain right to a coastal plain. Yemen is a little bit different in that regard. So it, it makes it a little more challenging to really stop their ability to observe ships at sea. But if you can take out the radar, uh, you can really uh, limit what they can do. And that was another thing. And then, interestingly, um, on the list of things, you know, with intelligence and other types of things that they hit, they hit a, a helicopter, at least one or two helicopters, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure why. We haven't seen helicopters used very recently, but if you may, may recall, at the beginning of the Houthi threat, that started with them actually seizing a ship at sea, and they delivered the commandos on board the ship using a helicopter. And I'm not sure if that was done to preclude a uh, future attack like that or that was done to make a little bit of a statement uh, in terms of directly limiting their capabilities uh, in that regard to take out maybe perhaps even the helicopter that was used in that particular uh, operation. I don't know, but it was interesting to see that they added that to the list. I want to look at this tweet from Lucas Tomlinson, who's uh, kind of just putting into perspective what we've seen here in the past. 24 hours. The U.S. military has launched airstrikes in three different countries in the Middle East within one day, Hal. Have we, uh, you know, do you believe the timing of these strikes could be in any way connected to the retaliatory strikes that were in Iraq and Syria yesterday? You, you, there might be some uh, thinking about this, which is, uh, you know, first off, what you didn't see today, uh, which is there at nighttime, is you didn't see a follow-on second strike, uh, uh, certainly on the level of what we saw with uh, Iraq and Syria yesterday. And and that may be for a variety of reasons. Number one is to keep them off guard. Remember, it's not just going against those specific groups. The the axis of resistance, you if you will, the uh, this, this plethora of groups that are supported by Iran stretches across the Middle East. So it could be, while they're expecting an attack in Syria and Iraq, we hit the Houthis, and it could be the thought was the Houthis may not be expecting us to do something like this. That would be something where we might achieve some sort of operational or tactical surprise in terms of what we're doing. The other thing, too, though, is I think that we're, 
looking uh, very hard at Iraq and Syria, trying to get uh, a battle damage assessment. How effective were our first round of strikes? What did we hit? What did we reduce? Do we hit, need to hit some of those targets again? Have they moved some things that we now need to target? There's a variety of different things that go into the whole targeting calculation, uh, in ter- and, and certainly with what we're doing. So it might be we're, we're buying time with that. We spent Getting all this some- money and all this time, and it's such a bullshit operation. Really won't move the needle at all. At all. It's just a, a flux of the muscles. So this is PNN, so I'm going to go to commercial here. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the supplements that you need to improve your health, to reduce pathogens, to get over um, ailments and and you know and colds and stuff like that, uh, but also to just boost up your immune system, get healthier, slow down aging. All right. Some of the products that I offer to help to improve your health is structural nano silver liquids. You take a teaspoon of this a day, either the max 14 or the max 35. If you're not feeling well, take a tablespoon or two a day. It's a great product. It helps neutralize pathogens as part of the anti-aging protocol. Another part of the anti-aging protocol is this very strong antioxidant. It's C60. You can get it in avocado or coconut oil. It is either in two ounce or four ounce or an eight ounce configuration. And uh, you take a teaspoon of it a day and you'll notice that you'll have more energy. You take it on an empty stomach it's the best, for the best absorption. And um, if you work out, take it before your workout and you'll notice that you'll recover quicker. It will help to soak up those free radicals, which are charged oxygens. And by soaking up those free radicals, less cellular damage will take place and your mitochondria will be able to produce more ATP. So go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. Link is in the description of this video and all my videos. And get the C60, a very potent antioxidant, part of the anti-aging protocol. Another thing that's part of the anti-aging protocol is bringing down inflammation. It's pro-inflammatory pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? Ashwagandha will bring down the blood glucose levels and reduce that in, that inflammatory response in the vascular tissue, in the vascular system, right? So take ashwagandha every day and also take it with turmeric. That will help to bring down that, that inflammatory response, right? And it's also an antioxidant. So the two, the, 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 the three pillars that make up the, the anti-aging protocol is liquids, structural nanosilver liquids, C60 to soak up the re, those free radicals and bring down inflammation with turmeric and ashwagandha. And then you add stuff, all right? D3, really important to absorb calcium, but not just that to help with gene expression, it's a cofactor, and it'll help to get rid of cells and have them get into apoptosis if they've been infected. Really important to have this. I take 10,000 individual units of this, all right? And each each little uh, soft gel is 5,000. So you take, you know, take one in the morning, take another one in the evening. Resveratrol. Antioxidant, it's a very good antioxidant. It's synergistic with C60, works well with C60. And not only that, it'll get rid of senesce cells. This is part of that anti-aging protocol to slow down that aging process and to get your tissues healthier. By doing that, you're gonna boost up your immune system. Vitamin C, also an antioxidant, but not as strong as C60 or resveratrol. But what is important is to help to boost up your immune system. And so you should take this every day. And if you're not feeling well, take a double dose of it. You drink it with water because it's water soluble and it will also help with your skin. 
because you need vitamin C to help to cross-link collagen. Clarity factor, really important to have that mental acuity. This will help to get rid of that brain fog. You can focus on your work, your school, get those dendrites firing, and you'll have better mental acuity. It's part of anti-aging protocol. If you don't have that, if you don't, if you don't challenge your brain by reading and writing and talking to people and learning new things and getting those neurons firing, then you're going to atrophy. Take my advice. I know what I'm talking about. And lastly, probiotic. You need a, pro, a good probiotic. I have it either in a powdered form or the one that I have in my hand is in a, in a capsule form. All right. It also has turmeric with it. By having a good gut biome, you're going to bring down inflammation. You're going to have better gut health. You're going to have better absorption. Your gut is going to communicate with your liver much better. Your gut is going to communicate with your brain much better. You're going to metabolize better. You're going to have more energy. And, you know, I'll tell you, in the United States, because of its diet, because of the, the foods that we eat, the GMO foods and all this, all, all this processed food stuff, it creates a very thin lining, uh, a barrier on the gut and disrupts, disrupts absorption. You want to stop eating that type of food and get your gut repopulated with the, the right gut biome. Go to my store, the-studio-rakevic.com and get the probiotics that I offer. So we're going to go back to live now from Fox. Target, it could be tomorrow night, which would be our tomorrow day, will be uh, when we hit uh, Iraq and Syria again, but I don't know. I'm not sure what our, our planning is or what our, you know, we've kind of left that a little bit open. And whereas we did certainly telegraph a lot of stuff that we did in, in Iraq and Syria. And obviously, there's been a lot of criticism uh, from a variety of different places uh, about the amount of telegraphing that went on. That the, the impact, uh, the impact of that first strike is going to be considerable. I'm President Biden, and I'm going to tell the Iranians, I'm telegraphing to the whole world that we're going to do something. Uh, so, but we, we're worried that Iran might, you know, get upset. So we're not going to do too much. We'll tell enough so they don't have to worry, and we won't go into a full-scale war with Iran, even though they are supporting directly Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis. The Houthis. I'm telling you, the White House, the Pentagon are a bunch of pussies. In fact, the initial reports are there was considerable, uh, but we're probably picking the time and place of our choosing to paraphrase Secretary Austin. And so we're going to figure this out. And, and frankly, I don't know. We could turn right around tomorrow and hit the Houthis again. And, and that would probably catch the Houthis off guard. You know, they're, they're trying to figure out where we're going to hit, when we're going to hit. And uh, so you want to achieve a certain amount of tactical and operational surprise in all these things. And so that could be why we're doing this it. This surgical it stuff the... is not going to work. It's too little, too late. It's not forceful enough. Countries start to back down when they see a lot of force and a lot of killing and a lot of destruction in a very short amount of time. Not this little surgical crap. Uh, you know, with a big strike like that in Iraq and Syria, the Houthis would not be expecting something tonight, and that would be specifically why it was hit uh, tonight, there, uh, there which is our today. Uh, yeah, and I should mention, there was a lengthy statement put out by the Pentagon, and you can see the length of it. Uh, the Pentagon's Twitter account does have the entire uh, statement posted online. We, uh, I just want to, you know, talk about yesterday as well. Let's announce to X formerly known as Twitter, on how we're going to bomb Iran. Proxies. The info war. Well, because, uh, you know, the initial round of strikes, we kept hearing over and over again, you know, the first phase was going to happen, and then 
when that first phase would come, it would not be the last. So we do expect there to be more. But have we learned anything about the first round overnight? Uh, is information kind of at a standstill for now, or do we have a little more clarity as to how exactly things went down? The, the battle damage assessment we have right now, which is n never the best battle damage assessment, is from the strike missions themselves. You know, they go in, they hit a target. And, and, and historically, and I've been doing this for a long time, historically, they tend to be a little bit inflated occasionally. It's like if you ask an F-18 pilot how they did with the strike mission, they did great. <laughs> Pretty much routine. That They always say they did well. And then later on, we get imagery, uh, pictures, if you will, of what they actually did. And it's like, yeah, okay, they may have done all right, but not, not quite as well as they may have made out the first time. So what we're going to do is we're going to look very hard at what was hit, how well it was hit, did it did it achieve the results that we we're hoping to achieve? Uh, and this won't just be in the visual spectrum. Uh, we'll be checking things because you know we're hitting intelligence uh, sites and things like that. So we may be picking up a variety of different ways, you know, electronic emissions and stuff to find out if certain facilities are actually back in operation again to what degree. Uh, we'll be looking at what are they using as alternate facilities to conduct some of those same uh, functions, if you will, uh, that they were doing. We're going to be looking at uh, movement of personnel, movement of equipment. Uh, certainly, if someone from Al Quds that was in a base that was not hit, the science are going to get into a vehicle and drive to another place. Well, if we can pick up on that and track that vehicle, I imagine we'll try to figure out what we can do uh, to address that potential target set. Uh, for lack of a better term. So there's a lot of things that, that are being done right now. You know, one thing I would anticipate is that we probably have a lot of drones, not just for intelligence collection purposes, but also drones that may be standing by for those, you know, those uh, very precise attacks to hit a moving vehicle or to hit a, a specific target that, that reveals themselves to get in a time-sensitive manner. So we may have some things like that standing by, and we may have some attack aircraft uh, standing by as well to also address those targets that may suddenly appear. It won't be something on the magnitude of what we saw yesterday. You're not going to see. It, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of logistics to do something like we saw yesterday with all the, the, the you know, the B-1B bombers coming out of the U.S. with the uh, array of ordnance that they have. That's not something you just, you know, snap your finger and make happen. That's something where you have to conduct a lot of planning, a lot of preparation to do missions on that order. But some of these things uh, we can do and we can do a lot faster, although we will not have the same effect across the board that we had yesterday with that. Same thing with the, 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 the Houthi strike that's just happened in Yemen. Uh, something on that magnitude where you're hitting, you know, 36 targets at 13 different locations. There is a phenomenal amount of planning preparation that goes into something like that. Uh, the British were part of that mission, and they have to fly all the way down from Cyprus, which means they have to get uh, in-flight refueling capability, aerial tankers to help them do that. So there's just a tremendous amount of logistics that go into this whole thing. Just listen. Just focus on what he just said. Tremendous amount of logistics on a bullshit strike. That costs a ton of money. This is why America is losing, losing big time. About a spokesperson for uh, one of those uh, militia groups in uh, Iraq, I think specifically, yes. So there's the tweet. It's Hussein al Masawi. He's a spokesperson for one of the main Iranian backed militias in Iraq. He spoke with the uh, Associated Press in Baghdad. He condemned the U.S. strikes house, saying Washington, quote, Most must understand that every action elicits a reaction. My question for you, Hal, what type of reaction is an Iranian-backed militia in Iraq capable of at this point? Well, that's what we're assessing. It. What can they physically do? What can they pull off? I mean, there's a wide spectrum. They can do, you know, terrorist attack stuff. They can do car bombings, things like that. And then they could do things. Uh, much Here's more. a great idea, national security state. Instead of spending so much time and money and energy focusing on domestic, attacking the domestic citizen of the United States, why don't you get your house in order and get the proper intelligence 
that we need in the Middle East to be able to execute a full out war instead of planting, you know, national security state little little groups to try to entrap American citizens. Another reason why America's losing. We are run by a bunch of idiots. Idiots. This kid, such as what we just saw happen in Jordan, where they put a drone uh, out there and, and basically used uh, our returning drone to drop to mask their drone coming in and hitting uh, you know the, uh, the the barracks facilities at that base in Jordan. So there's a, a wide spectrum of what they might do. One thing though is the the Iranians don't want this thing to escalate. And uh, right now the the Iranians. You know, they, they have to put a certain amount of over-the-top uh, hyperbole out there, rhetoric, if you will, for their own domestic audience. You know, oh, we're going to, you know, go after the great Satan or, or whatever it is they're, they're going to say. Uh, and I've heard them say, you know, that this is a dramatic escalation. This is a, a strategic mistake by the United States. All the sorts of standard boilerplate rhetoric that the Iranians put out and these militias put out on a pretty regular basis. I want the reality to... is, what can they actually do? What can they physically pull off? And that's what we're trying to assess right now is what can they do? If we've taken out their drone bases, if we've taken out most of their drone capabilities, if we've taken out those command and control centers where they control those drone operations, well, that's one thing that they may not be able to do, or at least certainly not something they can do in the near term. So we've had some success in that regard, if that is the case. That's what we're assessing right now. Have we been successful? And by the way, what we see on the ground, what we pick up on from a variety of intelligence sources, which could be uh, optical, it could be things in uh, measurements and signatures intelligence, there could be signals intelligence sort of thing that we pick up from the electronic spectrum. There could be a uh, human intelligence that we have. You gotta remember this is Iraq, we've been there for you know, decades, oh, have so we have a, a lot of capabilities in that regard, uh, residual capabilities. There's a variety of things that we're picking up on, and, and we're going to figure out exactly what they do have, and that will, A, roll out what the target list looks like for the next strike, but B, it will also tell us what we need to prepare for. Uh, they're going to try and respond, but, but with that, I think all these militias are being kind of pulled back to a certain degree, if, if everything I'm hearing is correct, by Iran. Iran has recognized they may have gone too far on this. They're looking at what the U.S. is doing in the region. Uh, they're also realizing that the U.S. Has I think in. what's going to happen is, is that they're, they, they'll they feel emboldened. And by doing that, they're going to escalate. And even though Esau is weak, they will make mistakes. And if the United States and Israel focus and get the job done they can be able to move a lot of ground they'll be able to 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 change the dynamic in the region it'll be harder after july so the time is now the time is now biden the time is now the iranians and the proxies are going to make mistakes they're going to make tactical errors level operationally that we were not before um you know to, to some for the world war ii you know they may have uh, they may have just awoken uh, uh, you know uh, awoken the bear if you will uh that the u.s is doing things uh watching those b1b's come in it's not just the amount of ordnance that they're able to deliver it's also the fact that the b1b bombers have come in from the united states and entered into this conflict and they and they have to be looking at that and saying that's something we haven't seen uh in iraq uh in in a couple of decades and that's got to be a real wake-up call to what we're going to do and and by the way the houthis might want to be paying attention to that too because uh if we can if you know if we're doing it for uh, iraq and syria there's nothing nothing to say that we might just consider using those same types of weapon systems uh, in Yemen to deal with that threat. And frankly, of the two, strategically speaking, the, the Yemen threat might be a little bit bigger because, well, frankly, it's, uh, it's, it's restricting 
one of the world's most important waterways. And that's something not just we, but well, all let of me our interject allies. a little bit. So I've been watching the oil market very closely as this is happening. Um, oil has been ticking up and then it went back down. It went, it, it was trading at about WTI, it was trading at about $72, a little bit more than $72 a barrel as of this recording. All right. Um, it went all the way up to as, as, as over 78, almost $79 a barrel. Um, so it's been bouncing back and forth between about 71 and, eight, and, and 80, somewhere in that range. Right. Um, now, you know, usually contracts are ending and the liquidity in the market ends at around two o'clock on Friday. Uh, there's still trading that's going on in New York, but the liquidity really drops in the oil market after about two o'clock, unless something really you know, major happens. Um, so this strike package has not been priced into the oil market. So it'll be interesting as the futures market opens up tomorrow on Sunday, Sunday night, um, even though that's, a, at least for WTI, illiquid because it's overnight trading. Um, but we'll at least have an idea in the Brent market how foreign oil will be trading. I suspect that it will be trading up because of this hap happening as, as a means of... Um, instability in the region could escalate. So I suspect that WTI will go up uh, from the, the, you know, the $72 a barrel mark, maybe as much as $2, maybe it'll start trading, you know, about the 74 handle. I don't, you know, we'll have to see. I'd be shocked if it trades below $72 a barrel, but there's this, there's this range that's starting to, to that I'm starting to notice. About 71 to about 80 is the, the high, the, you know, the, the low point and the high point of this range. And the reason is, is that there are these bottlenecks that are starting to, to take place. One, they're worried about an, it escalating and causing an oil crisis. And two, the ability to just move oil in the region. Now, most of that, if not all of it, is going to be Brent, not WTI. But the WTI market will trade closely with Brent. World uh, want to see uh, that waterway, um, you know, back in full operation. Um, Sally, the same spokesperson I had mentioned before, said that the targeted sites in Iraq yesterday were mainly devoid of fighters and military personnel at the time of the attack. Uh, and I think this is touching on what you were just talking about. If that is true, in what ways, Hal, could the U.S. be keeping tabs on the people that we were actually trying to target with strikes? Well, first off, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I don't think that's true, all right? In fact, I'm going to say, if he's saying it, I can pretty much guarantee it's not true. You know, they're going to somehow construe it that we, we attacked, you know, we hit an airbase, took out a hangar, and it was full of women and children. That tends to be the normal hyperbole, the normal rhetoric that we hear. I, I think we probably took out a number of fighters. Uh, I would be surprised if there was much collateral damage at all. One of the reasons that you would wait so long, and we did, we waited quite a long time for that strike, is that we are, we are specifically trying to avoid collateral damage. We are going back and vetting and revetting those targets to make sure that we're not going to 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 incidentally cause a lot of uh, casualties uh, with non-combatants, and that would be something I would expect. I would, I would certainly expect the militias, the the Iranian-backed militias or proxies, and Iran itself to completely misconstrue the nature of our attacks. Uh, but uh, but I don't think that's the case, um, and so therefore. Uh, I think we, we've had some effect there. I think we're just, we're going to have to, and we, we do this, but uh, sometimes, you know, uh, when you when there's so much uh, information being generated from the Middle East, sometimes these uh, these truly propagandist, propagandistic statements that are put out by Iran, sometimes they make it out there. And, and I just say with uh, to everyone, you got to have a grain of salt with that. They're, they're always saying that stuff. And by the way, uh, for an American audience, uh, the Iranians still describe the United States as a great Satan. 
you know, that's their standard rhetoric. So, um, you know, kind of kind of gauge whatever you're hearing from them and from their proxies with uh, with that with that kind of benchmark in mind of, of how they just describe the United States in general on any given day. Now we are uh, just seeing the president uh, just saying, get your free copy of my new best-selling book, Commercial Real Estate Investing for Beginners. All you have to do is click on the link below. Seeing the president, uh, just seeing Air Force One pop into frame here, and here on live now, we do like to bring live images to our audience as they come into us in real time. Uh, I want to take this uh, time to ask, you know, as the U.S. moves forward with this, we we know that they have indicated that there will be further responses, um, further retaliatory responses, but we really don't know too much about what those could look like at this point. Is that right? Well, we don't want. Uh, the Iranian proxies to know too much about what they're going to look like either. We want to keep them off balance. We want to maintain a certain amount of tactical and operational surprise. We don't want to know, want to know what we're going to hit, when we're going to hit, and how we're going to hit it. Uh, we would like them to actually uh, calculate all these things uh, uh, very wrongly, if you will, uh, and then we, we catch them completely off guard. That would be the hope. With that said, we have limited means. We don't have a a limited array of things we can do. Uh, when you have an aircraft carrier sitting off the coast, you can probably anticipate that we're going to have airstrikes. Uh, when you have uh, things that fire Tomahawk missiles off the coast, you could probably anticipate you're going to see some Tomahawk missiles. So it's not a, uh, an unlimited array of things that we can throw out there, but there are a, thing, a lot of ways that we can hit this, hit these targets in such a way that they're not expecting. By the way, there's other things that we can do which are less kinetic, which are also being done, which is a variety of sanctions things uh, in terms of where we put enforcement efforts on the international level. Uh, there's a lot of different things and, and putting pressure on certain allies in certain ways that they can do things uh, that we can't do as directly and they can change the entire operating environment uh, for our folks. By the way, uh, we mentioned the president is landing in Los Angeles, but my understanding is he's not coming here to see me. I just want to point that out. No, I don't think he is. Uh, yeah, we yeah, are, uh, sorry, yeah. point that in case there's any confusion. So. A absolutely. Yeah, you want to make that yeah. clear for the audience. And it looks like uh, the president and first lady are stepping off the plane right now. Uh, you know, as we continue, and this is something that you and I touched on yesterday as well, but we, we discuss how, you know, there were strikes in Iraq and Syria yesterday. There was strikes in Yemen today, all of these against some sort of Iran-backed group. Um, and, and I'll ask you the question I asked you yesterday. How does all of this, if it does, how does it tie in to what we're seeing in Israel and in Gaza? That's another Iran-backed group that we're talking about with Hamas. Well, Austin, that's another great question. And that's the one I think that uh, is not getting as much attention as it should, which is connecting this stuff. It's, it, nothing's happening in isolation. It's all happening across the board. One of the things that's happening right now is there is a very, uh, very uh, extensively negotiated um, proposal, if you will, for a, an extended ceasefire of 45 days in exchange for returning all of the hostages that uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad hold and in exchange for uh, prisoners and detainees that, that, uh, that Israel holds as well. Now, this one... Now, that 48 days... Or 45 days is going to eat up a lot of this three months of strength for Jacob in the weakening of Esau. It's stupid. It's stupid. Uh, from a metaphysical level, from a Kabbalistic level. I tell you, I, I tell you, you can, if you just, just step back and look at the metaphysics of this, you're going to see that we're marching into stupidity. Just, and it's going to be a calamity. It's going to be a calamity because we'll make it so many, so many errors. Well, this has been worked on. Uh, uh, CIA Director Burns uh, it was part of this. Uh, his Egyptian Qatari counterparts, Burns their foreign an, ministers. Burns is an idiot. Part of this, um, the uh, head of Mossad, the uh, Foreign Intelligence Service for. Israel was part of this. All of these extensive negotiations come up with a plan. It's a three-phase plan. Um, it's about 45 days, six weeks. Each phase, each two weeks, there's a uh, 
a certain category of, uh, of, of, of uh, hostages that will be released during that period, certain other things that will have to happen. This will provide a, a, a tremendous opportunity to get a, a lot of uh, very much needed aid into the uh, Palestinian uh, residents of Gaza, into some of these areas where they are uh, to, to deal with the humanitarian uh, concerns that have been voiced in that regard. So there's a lot of reasons why this may come about. And there's a lot of internal political pressure on uh, Bibi Netanyahu, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, to agree to this. With that said, Hamas was not part of those negotiations directly. They get this. Their first response has been, yeah, we want, uh, here's how we'll agree to it. Israel will withdraw all of its forces. We're going to come back to power. We take over the whole thing and we win. All right, that that obviously is a non-starter for Israel, uh, and 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 if you and and Israel kind of has come back with some of the more uh, sort of the same uh, side, which is that they want you know a, a variety of things from Hamas, which Hamas is not going to agree to. It's like any other negotiation; they got to come meet in the middle. One thing I will say is the negotiators involved understand all these positions extremely well. They know exactly what Hamas is going to think. They know what Israel is going to do. So they work through a lot of these arguments. It's just going to take a time, uh, take some time on each end for that to come through. Why am I going through that? Because that's happening right now. That whole process is happening now while these strikes are going on. If that comes in place, we may see in next week or maybe the coming weeks something rather startling, which is we may go from this current situation where you have all this kinetic action going on in Gaza, Iraq, Syria, you know, uh, coming out of uh, uh, Yemen with the Houthis. And it may turn into what we saw during that much shorter ceasefire that was earlier in Gaza, where all of the axis of resistance, uh, proxy forces of Iran, observed the ceasefire, and everything went quiet for an extended period of time. That's possible. And putting pressure on on the proxies, these other access of resistance proxies, at the same time this negotiation is going, actually facilitates, I think, the acceptance of this uh, of this proposal, certainly by Hamas. Iran might put pressure on Hamas to say, hey, look, you need to accept what's in front of you. Uh, that's possible. They'll never say that publicly, of course, but they may say this is a smart move because there's everything else going on. So I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It's not happening in isolation. It's happening in concert. With some of these things are happening there. By the way, the Israelis just today announced they're going into Rafa, which is the last big stronghold city in uh, southern uh, in southern Gaza, and uh, a lot of uh, civilian population that is that has basically been pushed into Rafa. It's the one place that were not military operations. So there's a lot of reasons why Hamas is feeling pressure right now, and this puts pressure on the entire axis, which puts more pressure on Hamas which makes something that this proposal more likely to happen than it would have been otherwise. Al Kemper, we appreciate you as always. And as we see uh, the doors of Marine One closing shut. The negotiation should be when Esau is stronger, not when Jacob is stronger. You should be hitting Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran when Jacob is stronger. It's flipped upside down, and I'm, I'm telling you, it, it, things when you got the international community getting involved in this, it just creates problems. President, about to start his trip through LA, he just arrived at LA. Right, let's let's take a look at what Fox News what, talked about this right here. Start a new career in real estate from the comfort of your home and change your life for the better. Define your own future and seize the opportunity. This is that Fox News alert the United States has started carrying out a wave of retaliatory strikes in Iraq and Syria. It comes five days after a deadly drone attack launched by Iran-backed terror groups that killed three American soldiers. Today was the dignified transfer of their remains. Let's go right to national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin. She's got a live update from the Pentagon. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Dana. Well, at 4 p.m. Eastern, the USVM carrying out airstrikes on six to seven locations, I'm told, in both Iraq and Syria. 
Uh, the U.S. Central Command just put out a statement in which they said that 85 targets have been struck at those different locations that were used by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. 125 munitions were dropped. We've reported and we've heard from U.S. defense officials that two B-1B Lancer bombers flew from the United States uh, to the region and carried out uh, some of these strikes. Uh, targeting, I'm told, multiple, multiple targets inside uh, these six to seven locations used by the Iranian proxies. Some of the locations were weapon storage facilities and included underground bunkers, headquarters, command and control nodes that have been used for the Iranian backed proxies to, to uh, store their drones and, and ballistic missiles and fire on those U.S. bases, as we've reported, 166 attacks on U.S. bases since mid-October. The one that turned deadly on Sunday, killing three Americans, uh, is was the trigger for this response. We're told that this is a campaign that has been drawn up by U.S. Central Command, that it will last for days, um, and that this is the first round, the first round of strikes. Um, we reported in the at about 3.30 today that there were explosions inside Syria at some of these sites. We're told they weren't airstrikes at the time, but that they were explosions. It was part of the, uh, the preparations being made for uh, the strikes on these targets. So a little bit of confusion earlier today, but we know for certain that the first airstrikes began at 4 p.m. Eastern. Amen. Okay, we're going to take it around the table here. Will, you want to go? No, I'm curious. I know Jennifer asked this earlier today. In speaking to the Pentagon, but how much heads up Iran had that these strikes were headed their way, um, how much they were able to evacuate from the targets, and then what, if that is the fact, is what is left from at least a personnel standpoint as who was actually the target in these strikes? Well, Will, I think um, it's been the worst kept secret in Washington that this campaign was going to begin in the coming days. Um, you heard the president talk about it. You've heard um, Pentagon officials talk about it yesterday here at the Pentagon. I asked um, Secretary Austin that very question. Here was the question. Has there been too much telegraphing or is the point not to kill any Iranian? Too much guys? telegraphing in terms and of, afraid uh, to kill. Telegraphing about strikes and whether or not uh, people uh, leave or what have left. You know, I won't speculate. Now, let, now, let, now let's re remind the public here that Lloyd Austin forgot to tell the White House that he had to go to the hospital. He didn't seem to be telegraphing too much back then, but now he's telegraphing a lot. Uh, I would just tell you that, uh, you know, it, we will have a, a multi-tiered response. So, Will, I think it would be safe to assume that given the time of day when they struck after midnight local time, and the telegraphing that had taken place, we had seen reports that Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps commanders had been called back to Iran. I would be very surprised if any of them had been at these bases. Um, there may have been a few people left behind, but, but not the senior commanders. Um, and I think perhaps that was by design. Again, you've heard the Pentagon and others say that they're not seeking a war with Iran. That's why U.S. officials are ruling out any strikes inside Iran at this time. But again, this is the first salvo. They're hoping that Tehran gets the message without this having to escalate. Great, Judge Pira. Uh, you know, Jennifer, I understand that the United States is saying that the not United States should have hit those targets with no warning. And Trump, if you think about it, Trump said even during you know his his uh, his administration and even when he was running for his first term, you know the problem that Washington DC has is that they tell the enemy that they're gonna hit them. You don't tell them and then you hit them. You get a better response because that region doesn't understand anything but force and tough guy moves. Or, but at the same time, there are those who believe that if you just hit the proxies in Syria and Iraq, that it's not going to matter to Iran. And that when Iran can separate uh, uh, itself from the proxies, saying, you know, they go rogue, uh, when the truth is the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps both trains them and pays them, uh, you know, it's kind of disingenuous. And then it, what is the point of our hitting the proxies? 
Well, it's a very good question. And certainly this this shell game that Iran has been playing in the Middle East by arming and supporting and training these proxies, whether it's in Lebanon with Hezbollah, whether it's these various groups in Syria and Iraq, whether it's the Houthis in Yemen, whether it's Hamas in the Gaza Strip, there is a common thread here, and it is Iran, and it is Tehran. And the U.S. has not figured out a way to put enough pressure on Iran to make it painful enough to for them to stop supporting these groups. And in fact, there are some who believe, and this is why it's a very delicate balancing act for the White House national security team, as well as the Pentagon, is how not to get baited into a war with Iran, because some believe that's what Iran wants, that they wanted uh, Israel to find itself in a war with Hamas and for uh, the U.S. We spent trillions of dollars in the Middle East and didn't get anywhere. Perhaps we should do something forcefully and quickly, like a blitzkrieg, and get the job done. I'll tell you, America is so, so weak on handling this. Uh, to you know, stumble into a larger conflict. And so that's what people are trying to avoid, but they also believe that by striking 85 targets, as well as uh, you know, a days long, if not weeks long campaign, that they can ratchet up the pressure on Iran. They're gonna lose a lot of uh, valuable property in, with, that their proxies have been using to torment and taunt uh, US bases for the last three months. Uh, the question you sh one should ask is, uh, what took so long? Of course, it's it's tragic that three Americans were killed, but uh, the, the U.S. troops sitting in Iraq and Syria have been sitting ducks for months now. Indeed. Uh, Jennifer Griffin, thank you so much. We want to get to Mike Tobin. He's in Israel and Tel Aviv. He's got the latest with reaction there, as they, I'm sure that they are on heightened alert as well. Well, they're always on heightened alert at this stage, Dan. And what I can really uh, confirm for you right now are just some of the locations. Uh, we have a source inside of Iraq who says, indeed, there have been uh, multiple targets struck in the area of Al Qaim, which is at the western border of Iraq, very near Syria. And this following uh, reports uh, throughout the day that the Al Mayadeen, the uh, Deir Azur area, the uh, Abu Kamal area were all hit. Uh, and this, these are areas that are kind of near the, uh, some of those cities are just on the banks of the Euphrates River. al Qaim is immediately across the border. So a lot of the real estate, at least where a lot of the strikes have been concentrated, is not a whole lot of real estate concentrated into about a 60-mile area. Uh, we know that there are other strikes inside of Iraq. The uh, U.S. confirming today uh, that there were some 85 different targets hit. Uh, by some 125 different munitions. And that is dramatically different from the early reports we heard that some eight different targets were hit. Uh, we anticipated that the numbers would change, and indeed they did change, as the U.S. is now confirming that they used uh, two of those big B-1, B bombers uh, to hit some of those targets inside of Iraq. You know? uh, Mike, we're going to take it on the table. I just, uh, Richard has a question, but let me just quickly ask you. There was talk earlier this week that there was uh, communication about a possible ceasefire in order to get more hostages out. Do you know where that stands at this moment? It stands at the point where Hamas and um, Islamic Jihad officials met, and they set out a number of their demands. They said, you're going to need to see a, a massive prisoner release. They want to see all Israelis withdraw from uh, the Gaza Strip and a cessation of, 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 uh, of uh combat inside of the Gaza Strip. They also want to see some restoration, rebuilding for all the destruction that was done inside of the Gaza Strip. So you have very broad uh, demands, if you will, coming from the leadership of uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas as far as a prisoner release goes. And that puts them very far apart from uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who says they want to see all of the prisoners released and Hamas dismantled. All right, Richard. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mike. Now, picking up where Dana left off, how does the how does the ceasefire negotiations sort of interplay with this strike and the fact that we now know today that um, Secretary Blinken will be returning to the region to visit Israel, the West Bank, uh, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia? Well, it, it clearly, Secretary Blinken is hitting all of the key players involved in this, uh, particularly when he talks to the Qataris, because the Qataris are the primary avenue to get in and talk to Hamas. He can't uh, discuss with Hamas directly. So the fact that uh, Secretary Blinken is coming here is uh, showing that at least there's an effort to move forward uh, with these hostage release negotiations. But keep in mind, you have to be patient, and unfortunately, you have to be pessimistic. If you look at the example of Gilad Shalit, when he was kidnapped, 
It took six years and a thousand Palestinian prisoners to get him released. So now you're talking about over a hundred uh, that we know that are still alive, or at least we have information that are still alive in Hamas captivity. Uh, so you can't be optimistic that you're really talking about more than women and children and elderly uh, being released, released in this round of talks. All right, Mike Tobin, thank you. I want to get to Rich Edson. He's at the White House with the latest there. Hi, Rich. Hi, uh, hey Dana. We've just gotten a statement from President Biden. The first we've heard from him since these retaliatory strikes, he notes that he did attend the dignified transfer of the three soldiers who were killed in that drone strike over the weekend. And now the response to this, he says this afternoon in his direction, U.S. military forces struck targets at facilities in Iraq and Syria that the IRGC, that's the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps, and affiliated militia used to attack U.S. forces. He goes on to say that our response began today and it will continue at a time and place of our choosing. That's a line at the White House and the administration have been using now for some time. He also says the U.S. does not seek conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else in the world, but let all those who might seek to do us harm know this. If you harm an American, we will respond. The president, as he mentioned, attended that dignified transfer earlier today. He's back home uh, at his home in Delaware uh, today. Where Except when the national security state harms an American citizen. Then our government doesn't do it anything actually encourages it. Uh, we expect, uh, or we weren't expecting to hear much more from him today until he released this statement. Um, there has been plenty of criticism of the White House and the time that it has taken in this response, several days uh, since the drone attack on early Sunday. You had a number of congressional Republicans saying that it should have been uh, a robust response and one that should have happened shortly thereafter that attack. Um, Senator Lindsey Graham had said earlier today, before the details of the strike came out, that the lapse of time has lessened the impact of deterrence, and by not hitting oil infrastructure in Iran or Revolutionary Guard personnel, you will have failed to make the point. Iran is one of those subjects, one of the many subjects, that Republicans and the White House have been at odds over since the beginning of the administration. The White House has tried to get the U.S. back into the Iran nuclear deal. Those attempts have failed. There was the prisoner swap, and you remember the $6 billion that the administration uh, was going to unfreeze for Iranian assets. The U.S. said that that fell apart, especially after uh, the Hamas attack on Israel and uh, Iran's support for Hamas. So this okay. continues to be a point of friction, and we'll get more updates from Capitol Hill as the details come out. Quick question from me and then the judge and Will. I, I just have, has the White House called a lid for the day? The White House called the lid a couple of hours ago, which is why this statement was a surprise. The lid, of course, meaning you're not going to hear from the president today. And then, of course, we did. And so as this continues, we may expect to hear more from administration officials and from the White House. All right, Judge Janine. You know, it's very interesting to hear the administration say, quote, if you harm an American, we will respond. It, it, it appears that they harmed over 100 Americans before the United States responded. And the United States is making it clear that it doesn't want a broader war. I mean, the, 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 the Republicans obviously don't agree with the stance of this administration. I mean, does anyone think this is really going to change things based upon this kind of tepid response? Yeah, you know, Judge, you look at the nearly 170 attacks on U.S. positions in Iraq and in Syria and now in Jordan, since the middle of October, and there has been plenty. 166. Now, some of them have concussion issues. We have the three that were killed at Tower 22. And this strike seems very kind of superficial that we did. Now, maybe it'll, it will get worse. I don't know. I suspect not. But, um, you know, 166, they're emboldened. Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, Iran. We are looking weak. And we have a weak president with a weak Pentagon. Criticism about the several attacks that the U.S. has had on positions in Iraq and Syria since those attacks began and sort of the timeline that it took just for those retaliatory responses. And now what's uh, ostensibly the largest response that we've had to date. The administration has justified its responses in saying that it's trying to maintain deterrence by trying to ensure that this doesn't spread wider, a conflict doesn't spread wider in the Middle East because you've got 
Israel fighting Hamas in Gaza. You've got Israel and Hezbollah on the Lebanon border going back and forth. You've got the Houthis in Yemen attacking shipping in the Gulf of Aden and in the Red Sea. And now you've got all of these attacks on American positions on the Middle East. But the Republicans have argued, and those like Senator Lindsey Graham have argued, that unless you have something that is really robust and shows that you mean business, you're not showing that. In fact, you're only inviting more of these attacks. Jets in at the White House, thank you. And if they let, let me away. do a quick commercial here, because this is PNN. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the toothpaste that I offer. This is made from structural nano silver. It has no fluoride in it. It will whiten your teeth, freshen your breath, reduce gingivitis, reduce that gum irritation, and not only that, improve your cardiovascular health because with good oral hygiene, you're going to reduce cardiovascular disease and valvular disease. Please go to my store, the-studio-rakefit.com, and get the toothpaste that I offer. This toothpaste is the best toothpaste that you can buy, all right? Way better than anything that Alex Jones sells. Go to my store, the-studio-rakefit.com, and help support my work. I also have structural nano silver gel. It helps to neutralize pathogens. You put it on your hands, it stays active for five hours. You can put it around your mouth, around your nose, lately coat your nostrils, around your, your ears, around your eyes, and it will help to reduce pathogens, all right? It will also help to heal your skin if you have an abrasion, minor burn, some cuts. I also have structural nano silver lozenges and drops. I have honey and lemon in a hundred count for the drops. It's made from structural nano silver. So it's gonna, re it, it'll neutralize pathogens, but not just that, it will help to soothe the throat. Blueberry drops, hundred count. I also have green apple lozenges in 20 count. And I also have this, this two new products, these two new products, elderberry and zinc in 21 count lozenges. And I have also Manuka honey in a 21 count. So please go to the store and get the lozenges for, you know, in near the tail end of the, you know, the cold season, but we're gonna go into the spring and you're gonna have some irritation because of, of um, you know, allergies. So get some drops, get some lozenges, and that will help your throat. I also have structural nano silver soaps. I have lavender. It's a high quality soap. It's made from structural nano silver. It'll help to neutralize pathogens. Oatmeal. And um, peppermint. Here's the peppermint one. And I have charcoal tea tree now, back in stock. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the structural nano silver products that I, that I offer. I have a lot of different products, not just structural nano silver products, but I, I sell a multivitamin, easy to digest. You need minerals and vitamins as cofactors for enzymatic activity. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the multivitamin. Added that to the protocol that I've been talking about to help to improve your immune system, to slow down the aging process and get your body healthy. It is important, especially in the United States, to start to improve your cardiovascular system and your heart health. You need to control your lipid profile. All right, we have HDL and LDL levels and triglycerides and cholesterol that is, that is uh, out of whack in, in the United States. Many people have low HDL, very high LDL, very high triglycerides, very high cholesterol. You want to control that, all right? To be able to control your lipid profile, you need to work out more often, watch what you eat, so proper diet, proper exercise, but proper supplementation to bring up your HDL and to bring down your LDL, bring down your triglycerides, bring down your cholesterol level. Go to the store and get my omega-3. It'll help with your cardiovascular health. 
and you know get that get that whole lipid profile in balance. Go to the store and get the omega three. I'm telling you, heart health is really important. Diabetes, heart disease, lung disease are really prevalent in the United States. Let us know. Let you know. Okay. Think about the table here, Judge. You know, what's interesting about all of this is that the United States, as in my last question to Rich, is the United States is not going to respond. It's not by going into Tehran. Okay. When Donald Trump was president, he took uh, took out Soleimani, who was the head of the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps. Now, if the United States made the decision to go after that island, wherever that island is, where they have that oil supply, then we would hurt Iran economically and hurt consequently all of the proxies. The problem is, if we did that, then the price of oil would go up in a presidential year. So, you know, the administration, again, is in this schizophrenic, like, we're going to let Iran sell oil in the open market. We're going to let them keep the billions of dollars that they got from our hostage exchange. But we're going to warn them not to touch Americans. But only after they touch 100 and then kill three will we respond. It's a schizophrenic. It's not clear what we're willing to do. There's a huge amount of capability. I, mean, I think that she, if, if I think might, her, her assessment with the oil is uh, pretty much on the money. They're worried about that range breaking 80 because once it starts to break 80 for WTI, it starts to march up, then you're going to start seeing gas prices. And you got to remember, people are going to want to go on vacation in the summer. And if they're going to see high gas prices in the summer, it's going to be uh, very problematic for Biden to be reelected in November. Three, five strikes. 85 targets, that's a huge amount of cap capacity that Iranian-backed um, proxies have in order to attack our troops who are there. So uh, you know, if, there's, if there's several more days of this, then that's a lot of capability that we've allowed them to build up. Exactly. I, I would make two points. Around. Around. We we uh, actually, Greg, it's your response to this, but one of the micro and one of the macro. On the micro, I don't see that much has actually happened. In, in terms of some strikes, yes, that has occurred. What has it done to deter Iran? If they have Nothing. a heads up warning to pull their exactly. ankle out, Nothing. then I don't know that anything message has been sent that would deter them in the future. But the macro is, and forgive the not so subtle plug, but I had Senator Rand Paul mm -hmm. on my digital show this week, Will Kane Show, and he said this. He said, when it comes to the Houthis, strike them and strike them home. They're, they're messing with their national shipping lanes. When it comes to this story, what we're looking at right now, why do we have guys scattered across Syria? Exactly. Why do we have guys scattered across Iraq? Exactly. Why are we leaving ourselves vulnerable to the potential for an attack to Iran? Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube. Okay, so that's just an overview of what's going on um, from Al Jazeera, from Fox, from uh, Live. Was it Live Now? Fox. Um, so to get a little bit of a flavor that I think, yes, you know, for news consumption, we, you know, we had a strike package that's hitting these proxies, all right, because of the three deaths in in Tower 22 and, you know, these other strikes that have been happening since October. It's a little too little, a little too late. And we're afraid to do the right thing. And that is get the job done. Stop kicking the can down the road. It's only going to get worse. It's time to hit them now. The iron is hot. This whole Kabbalistic strength between Esau and Jacob, Jacob from now to July is going to be strong. It's time to strike. And the peak of the strength will be in April. So what the hell is the United States waiting for? Because we're run by a bunch of pussies. So... Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. I've partnered up with R Rainbow Herbals, and we've created these deodorant bars. It's for males and females. It'll also help to detoxify your body. It's made from essential oils from the Himalayas. It's very high-quality ingredients. So you use it as a deodorant, and it'll also help to detoxify your body. It's made, the scent for for one version is citrus. The other is peppermint tea tree lavender. Uh, please go to the store and get a couple of these bars. They're very high quality to help rainbow herbals 
and her business um, and for you to get healthy. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and purchase these very, very high quality deodorant bars for your family. Thank you for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to all my channels. I have three channels on YouTube. I have Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. Please subscribe to all six channels. I'm heavily censored on YouTube for various things that I say. So it's, you know, so you, for you to see my content, it's important that you subscribe to all six of my channels. Also, for the ones that can, please, uh, please donate if you'd like to help support my work. You can donate on my website, the-studio-reykjavik.com. At the very bottom of the homepage, you can donate through Stripe, PayPal, or Buy Me a Coffee. The links are in the description of this video. And please, uh, subscribe, be a paid subscriber to my Patreon channel. And if you are a higher tier member, you will get access to my pulmonary module lectures. Different tier level will get different access. Or you can go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and purchase the pulmonary module. That is for $50 and you will get 22 PDFs, PDF files and lectures that are associated with those, those PDFs and you will learn pulmonology. Um, now, the reason why I'm doing these lectures is, is to, to, to have um, uh, a growing followership to become a citizen scientist, to learn about you know, some of the essentials of medicine so you can discern the news for yourself. And you don't have to listen to people like me and you won't have to listen to other people and you can discern it for yourself, all right? You'll be able to read the, the research articles for yourself and you'll be able to um, listen to the mainstream news for yourself and, and determine what's best for your health and, and the health of your family and to reduce the power differential between the patient and, the, and your physician. When you are more educated in medicine and in science, then you are not gonna be beholden on what the doctor wants to do. You'll be able to discern what treatments are best for you, what, what path of, of, um, of medical care you, you would prefer, all right? But if you're not educated on this, you really don't, you're just beholden to that power imbalance. Become a citizen scientist. Go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and purchase the pulmonology module that I have created. There's gonna be 22 lectures. Each day I populate a new lecture. Each business day I populate a new lecture. There are four lectures already up there. Embryology for the pulmonary system the anatomy of the pulmonary system, um, uh, hemoglobin, I go into detail about hemoglobin and the, uh, I lecture on physiology of the pulmonary system. So please go to the store. You're gonna learn a lot and other systems of the body I will be populating in due time. Thank you for supporting my work and have a nice night.